It's my pleasure to welcome you to the second day of the fabulous 2012 Sea Setting Conference. Kicking us off this morning, we have my friend Mike Gibson. Mike and I started the blog Let a Thousand Nations Bloom some years ago to write about the political issues around seasteading and similar ideas. And Mike works at Clarium Capital and at the Teal Foundation. Come on, Mike. Not, not yet. Thank you, Patre, for your introduction. I wouldn't be here if it weren't for Patre. About five years ago, I was a doctoral candidate in political philosophy at Oxford University. But I was frustrated. It was remarkable to me how unoriginal most academic political philosophers are. And I couldn't understand why so many respectable philosophers would spend their whole careers, their whole lives really, adding the 10th decimal place to already existing views. Why propose an idea that might undermine your career? Better to play it safe and discuss footnote 124 in the theory of justice by John Rawls. <laughs> I, start, I started to wonder, why are there so few bold new ideas? In a design space that offers a multitude of possibilities, instead, I only found a lot, a lot of conflict over a handful of shop-worn issues. It came to a point when I didn't want to join this mess, and I did, didn't want to fight it out, so I left, and I thought my interest in political theory was over. Then about a year later, Patri started the Seasteading Institute with help from my current boss, Peter Thiel. Patry said he needed help starting a blog that would discuss the economics and philosophy of seasteading, the vision of the idea. I wrote him an email saying I'd love to help. Let a thousand nations bloom was born. And suddenly political philosophy was back in my life. But it wasn't long before I understood how utterly different this was. Now, I had only just heard of Peter Thiel. The first job I took when I came back to America was as a journalist at a tech magazine, MIT's Tech Review. I had been assigned a story to interview Max Levchin, one of the co-founders of PayPal. It had been five years since Max had won an award from Tech Review, so I called him to interview him about what he'd been up to since selling the company. I'll never forget this call. I asked Max if he could go back five years and give his younger self advice. What would he tell him? Max said, after selling the company, I took a year off, traveled the world, and relaxed on beaches. And that was the worst year of my life. Silence. I was shocked. They had sold the company to eBay for $1.5 billion. I didn't know what Max share was, but this is the worst year of your life? That was insane. Then he said, I'm not a consumer, I'm a producer, and I want to build another great company. My first thought was, I'm not working hard enough, and I'm not working on the right problems. The cardinal sin was coasting. I'd never heard of Peter, or Max, or Elon Musk. I looked into these guys. After PayPal, Peter had started a hedge fund and a venture capital firm, much else besides. Elon started an electric car company, and what? No? Yes, a rocket ship company. Who were these people? I didn't know it then, but I know it now. These are the real political philosophers, not the academics. These are the secret philosophers. PayPal started with the idea of privatizing currency. They had dreams of using strong cryptography to protect wealth from inflation. In the end, they didn't quite realize that vision, but they had come to see that a small group of highly motivated people can create technological solutions to legislative and political problems. You don't have to wait for justice when you can deliver it with technological progress. Elon, Peter, and Max had optimistic and definite views about the future and were willing to risk being wrong. There are many ways to think about political philosophy, but this is the most relevant to me now. You have optimistic views of the future, and you have pessimistic views. And you have the definite and the indefinite. An indefinite view is portfolio investing. You don't know which company is going to succeed, so you take bets on many. A startup is definite. You believe your product and no other is the solution, so you stake your livelihood on it. Being single is indefinite, maybe optimistic, maybe pessimistic. Being married is definite, or at least some of us hope so. I've mapped out some of the traditional political philosophies on these dimensions. The philosopher John Rawls is perhaps the most famous political philosopher of the last century. He wrote a book called A Theory of Justice. Its main idea is a thought experiment. We're supposed to pretend we don't know who we are and then design a society so that when we find out who we really are, even if we're the worst off, we'll be okay with it. This is all well and good, but how does this actually help you build anything? 
How do you possibly wear this veil of ignorance? Does anyone know how to apply this? I don't think so, and that's why I put it in the indefinite category. Carl Schmitt was an esoteric Nazi philosopher of jurisprudence. He thought men, regardless of the topic, would always be divided into friends and enemies, fighting in zero-sum games, hence pessimistic indefinite. The lower left is full of pessimists who have definite views. The world is ending in scarce resource, with resource scarcity or in an inferno. Let's learn to live with that by retiring to the Shire. <laughs> but in the upper left, that's where I think we should be. That's where I think the real philosophy is. Definite optimistic views of the future. I've listed some views. I've listed some examples in governance from the past that were both optimistic and definite for their time. William Penn was the architect of the first constitution to establish religious freedom. This was in Pennsylvania in 1682. What's incredible is that he accomplished this stroke of genius in an age of burn your eyes out and then light your body on fire extreme intolerance. Penn's territory was the first to protect freedom of conscience, and the upshot was a massive flow of people to Pennsylvania from the other colonies. Soon they too had to match the right Penn had recognized. Here's another set of innovators, 18th century pirates. Yes, that's right, pirates. Their system of governance was very inventive for its time. Half a century before James Madison wrote the US Constitution, pirates had invented their own versions. Because pirates could choose to work on a handful of other ships, captains had to offer reasonable terms and protections. And the pirates quickly learned to govern themselves with these constitutions. What's interesting to me here is that the typical pirate wasn't half the theorist that James Madison was. And yet because the conditions permitted it, these pirates evolved forms of governments that bore a strong resemblance to the complex constitutional democracy Madison later proposed. The deed came first, the theory later, they didn't need any PhDs. <clears throat> Hong Kong is here because they instituted a very specific set of rules and the rest of China did something else. Only 20 years after that, the results were embarrassing for the Maoists. Today, the Chinese government is taking the Hong Kong model and replicating it elsewhere. One of the dangers of sea with seasteading is that it will remain forever in the indefinite optimistic quadrant. My challenge to everyone here is that we need to be optimists but we need to be definite in our vision because the true political philosophy is in action. So what's the first step? This chart describes the typical technology adoption life cycle. First, a few diehard fans who believe in the mission begin to use a product, and over time, adoption grows. But while finding early adopters is relatively easy, it turns out transitioning to the early majority is extremely difficult. Entrepreneurs here in Silicon Valley know this well because it's very difficult to introduce a new product. It has been said that if you build a better mousetrap, the world will beat a path to your door. Whoever said this didn't run a startup in a market against vested interests. <laughs> Unless innovators have invented a cure for cancer where the demand is obvious and instant, most of them have to create markets in addition to products. Whatever seasteading is, its benefits, at least right now, aren't initially as obvious as a cure for cancer. It's either like the Segway or it's going to be like Facebook. The Segway was supposed to revolutionize personal mobility, but it died in the chasm between early adopters and an early majority. People looked like dorks on these things. <laughs> and they weren't especially useful, except maybe for mall cops. <laughs> on the other hand, let's look at Facebook. It's a wonderful product with a clean design but it would have fallen flat if Zuckerberg had released it to everyone around the world at the same time. One of the key problems Facebook solved was getting people to feel comfortable posting their true identities on the internet. At the time, MySpace was very lurid, characterized by falsehood pseudonyms and fake accounts. People could sign up as tigers or dead celebrities or both. both because, but because Facebook started on campuses where people trusted their classmates, they created profiles that would more credibly mirror their real world identities. On top of that, Zuckerberg sparked a status cascade by beginning the whole thing on the most exclusive campus in the world. Not only did that add credibility to the site, but it seems it also added cachet for all the other schools down the line. The lesson for seasteading is that a rollout has to happen in a certain sequence. If rule sets and governance are a kind of technology, imagine how hard it is to introduce new political orders. <clears throat> you, can release it, you can't release it to the world all at once. Freedom of conscience was introduced into the political market by William Penn in a colonial backwater in 1682, far away from the burning intolerance of England. 
But the early adopters were evangelists, literally, and the success of the policy created a cascade throughout the colonies and then eventually back to Europe. As in Facebook's rollout, in this story you will not find explanations involving deliberation, reasoning, and open political philosophy. Instead, you find search, experimentation, and the snowball up the curve. So what does this mean for us? Everyone here is either an innovator or an early adopter. If we want to change the world, we need definite and optimistic views. In short, I think we need real philosophy. Thank you.